Welcome back. My name is Pete Contino. This is my show, Accordion Brat. I'm not going to talk too much. Um, Just a little recap. This is my father's story, Dick Contino. If you're not familiar with Dick Contino, please go to um, YouTube and check it out. If by chance you stumbled onto this podcast and don't know who he is, um, he was like a world-renowned accordionist. Uh, last episode was his his rise to you know getting into the Horace Hyde show his rise to fame. This episode is his continuing rise, but he starts to hit some bumps. By this time, there's a girl named uh, Debbie. See, uh, she was on the show uh, from out of Fresno. This girl was Playboy City, and she was like. <laughs> My girl, so she was, but she had eyes for me. See, so by now I'm still, in, you know, very inhibited, and uh, but she, you know, so she, she's coming at me even more because I'm like shy and oh, she's eating this stuff up. She's like 21, and I was what 18, I just turned 18. And Pete, she was something else. Body and all, you know, and, and she, she was a hornball, but she let you know it. And I said, no, I, so I, I was playing these games with her. How do I, how do I do something here and not get expelled from the church? <laughs> how do I get away with a mortal sin? <laughs> so I gave her a bunch of shit and conversation, you know, and somehow at one point I said, Debbie, I... I like it. One day we had this, this dinner. We were in we were in Omaha, uh, Omaha at the time. See, ready to go to Des Moines, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska. We're sitting at the dinner table, you know. And she says, "How come you don't want to just be with me? To, you know, have a cup of coffee or come to my room or whatever you're saying." So where I got this line, probably from an old George Raff movie or something. I says, "You have too many chalk marks. <laughs> you, know, you draw too many lines." <laughs> what do you mean I draw too many lines? <laughs> so I thought, well, fuck it. Yeah, you draw too many. You draw too many lines. You know, you use too much chalk. <laughs> oh shit! Talk about immaturity. You know. By the time we get to Des Moines, Iowa, I, I get pleurisy and my back. I mean, I'd be, I'd be going to play, and uh, all of a sudden, like a sharp pain in my back. Pow! Oh, you know. Geez, so it was like one of those movie things again, you know. So I well, I'm fucking, if I lose, I go back to Fresno. You know, there's always that, back to the moon, baby. And that was part of my problem, I guess. The overall problem. So, uh, Italian guy there, you know, in Des Moines. Oh, oh yeah, Horace Height tells me at that point, he says, see, at that time they didn't know. They weren't sure I was building up all this terrific following now that the, the audiences were growing rapidly, you know, in the court. So um, he says, you know, Philip Morris, uh, they're not sure about this. Uh, they're not sure that that maybe you're winning because uh, you're coming on last, you know. So you got a chance to prove yourself here. We'll put you in third spot, and we'll have somebody else close do the fourth spot. So you'll either prove that you're not just winning because you're on last, but you're winning because you deserve to win. Well, I don't want to tell him I got Porsche in my back and could he pick another week. I just said, oh, yeah, well, okay, you know. There was a guy who played a, what they call a lacarina. Ocarina, it was a, like they call it a potato, you know. You could play like uh, Nola or something on one of these, like a potato thing, you know. And he was closing the show. Anyway, you back to the Italian guy. He says, he says, oh, here you got, you got, yes, I got this pleurisy in my back. I guess it's a cold. He says, 
I know just the right round of you, Italian guys. Just before the show, he says, I want you to have a couple of glasses of wine. Look, I'm just a kid, like 18 years old, you know. And he says, uh, get in the tub and let that muscle relax. But the hot water, he says, I want you to, just before the show, get out of the tub, put your clothes on, bundle up, go play, and come on back. You know, talk about power of the mind or maybe whatever. I followed the, you know, the instructions that way, and I, I went there, and I'm in third spot. I played Dizzy Fingers and uh, Bella Shake. I you know, incorporated the Bella Shake now in anything, you know. And uh, so I played Dizzy Fingers, so I won, you know. I, wham, you know, I, I, I run back to the hotel, and, uh, you know, uh, climb right in the sack. Geez, I, went, I called home. As soon as I say, Hello, oh, my, you know, all of it, and he probably about 300,000 relatives around the phone. I'd hear, they're screaming, you know, they had just heard the show on radio, and I won another contest, number six. Blah, 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 blah. So, right, oh, geez, I'll just get to bed, huh? There's a knock on the door. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I go to the door, and I said, who is it? And I see, she says, it's Debbie, you know. So I figured, oh, fuck. So I opened the door, and she's standing there, and she says, I threw away the chalk. So about this time, I took a look at her, and I said, fuck the guilt. Here you are. You're going to get it this time. So anyway, <laughs> I got she got in the room, man. I didn't think about confession or anything. You know, I'm wailing away with Debbie, man. So for a while after that, you know, we ride on the bus, we're holding hands, and I was a young stud. I mean, if any girl wanted to go six times in the day, I could pop six times in the day. I was a fantastic libido, I guess. So anyway, she was, <laughs> I had to walk away from that, though, because, you know, And the guys couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. His dick, he's got Debbie, and nope, she, she didn't care for anybody else. Uh, so anyway, I go on, let's see, I went number six in Des Moines, and, and uh, seven, I think, was Youngstown, Ohio, with a, their leading talent was a tenor singer. And then I'm into... Contest number nine or ten, whatever, still on the piece. By this time, when I walk out on stage, it seemed like before I walk, as I walked out, and the audience was there. I just to sit there. She didn't. They didn't keep us secretly behind the curtain. The contestants would be sitting on stage before the show went on the air. And uh, when I walked out to sit down, I sometimes get more applause than and some of the other acts would get after they performed. The, the the thing caught on like magic plus magic plus. But even so, before now, before we get to Brooklyn, back then Brooklyn was very prejudiced. Everything you know, back then it was like Brooklyn. He's from Brooklyn. They were like supposed to be very clannish. So I was gonna I was gonna do a song I think called uh, at that time I think I was do the Gay Ranchero. Somebody da 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 but da da you know. And so Height heard me rehearsing it, and he says, this guy, even though he wasn't a musician, he, he knew a lot about, uh, innately, about what audiences might like or not like. So uh, he says, you're not going to win with that song in Brooklyn. He says, you got to do the beer barrel polka. Even the arranger says, beer barrel polka in Brooklyn? You know? He says, yeah, do an arrangement. So I thought right away, you know, uh, Grandpa thought maybe got a little paranoid. Maybe Hyde doesn't want me to win. That's why he wants me to play Bear Barrel Polka. So we did a thing with Bear Barrel Polka with a, you know, long bellow shake at the end and stuff. And, and uh, but before that, see, now Grandpa's really scared. We're in Brooklyn. Um, I've won about 10 or 11 contests. Whatever it was, right around there. And uh, so he goes to sit in the audience next to uh, you know, my mom, and he's white, he's pale, he's so, he's so, you know, with such anticipation. So my mother, I told him, I mean, honestly, to me at the time, she says, you better get out of here, you know, the way she talked. He says, you better get out of here, because if Dick sees you over here and you pass out, he's not going to be able to play. <laughs> so, 
so I, <laughs> my dad gets up and leaves. <laughs> you know, I knew he wasn't there. I figured, well, he probably went to the went to the men's room, you know. And I was too engrossed on stage. Anyway, I assumed he's all right, or they would have said, hey, your dad's sick or something, you know. Anyway, on that show with, with Beer Barrel Polka, I won by the biggest margin of any contest, by 30 points. It wasn't even close. So now I'm competing in the New York area, Manhattan, Bronx, contestants, and I'm beating them. So now I'm at, at the end of the first quarter. But there are no, it's not like I'm competing against other winners. I was undefeated. So Heights says, we got to have a, he said, we got to have a quarterfinal. So they got together and decided, well, uh, let's put him up against five of his closest competitors in the first quarter. And, uh, of course, right away, you know, people who were trying to protect me so dearly, like my folks or whoever else, saying, why does he have to compete again against them? Why didn't they just make him the quarterfinal, the quarterfinal winner? And, you know, why does he have to, you might lose the quarterfinal after winning all those contests, you know, that type of thing. But I still had in the back of my mind that that wasn't my security. That wasn't my security. Family was my security. Family, Fresno, whatever. It was like that was my security. Out here were things that, that was my innate thing, which was part of my downfall, so to speak, as far as phobias, too much dependency. So anyway, I competed and I won. And by this time, you know, they got... Uh, all this publicity going and billboards. Now I'm a guest on the show while I'm waiting for the three other quarterfinal winners to be determined for the next the following nine months to go up against them in the finals. But a strange thing started to happen, you know, uh, a guy named Howard Wormser. Howard was, you know, Heights number one PR person. Well he was I don't know at the time, he was gay. So what, you know, but I mean he but you know he uh, I guess maybe he had a crush on me. Who knows? You know, what I mean? he had, but he wanted to, he wanted to make sure he was protecting me. So when Hyde had a meeting, you know, uh, that uh, you know, Contino was getting too big for the show, so he wanted my name taken down off the all the promo, the billboards and everything. And so Howard came to me and told me about that. See, all during that while I was waiting for the other three quarter finalists, I was getting too big for the show. So, uh, okay, so we kind of edited that. In the meantime, we're building up two separate camps. You know, what the height was trying to do. So as we go to determine, you know, the other three quarter finalists, we get to the fourth quarter. There's a blind xylophonist by the name of Pierce Knox. He was bald headed at the time, you know. I mentioned that for a reason. He was very good, he was excellent and uh, exciting. He, but according to the rules, see, he went through, he was the only under, other undefeated uh, quarter finalist. But he did have one tie. So, that qualified me to close, which might have been the, the edge I needed, I don't know. Because he was very good and he was blind. Let's be, you know, let's face it. And uh, he played all those exciting things like I was doing on the accordion, he was doing on the xylophone and marimba, you know. I knew that he had his, uh, he possibly had his weapon to, you know, knock me off, off my pedestal, so to speak. In his mind, if Pierce Knox would uh, beat me in the finals. So a guy named uh, Tiny, uh, Tiny Hutton, uh, a big fat guy, you know, who drank milk with booze because he had a bad stomach. He liked me a lot, you know. So he was saying, you know, Height's really pulling for Pierce. I, I heard overheard this person saying, that person saying that Height pulling this and that. So uh, before I competed in the finals in Washington, D.C., Uline Arena, the then Vice President Barkley uh, was uh, the guest, uh, the Secretary of, the, of Agriculture, Secretary of Defense or whatever they were, the judges, watching the applause meter, so it was whew, top banana, top drawer. Seat maybe 12, 13,000 people in this huge 
Uline Arena. And, uh, but Natty and Grandpa, knowing Height's flight to dethrone me that way, to bring me down a couple notches, in his mind anyway, they went on ahead to Washington, D.C. <laughs> Damn. I went, I guess I'd do that. I always makes me want to wonder, you know, maybe I could be doing more, a lot of things regarding my kids. Uh, you, get, you know what I mean? I, and you pulled into that. Wait a minute, let me get back to the story. They went on ahead to different Italian functions, organizations, and you got to show, because the, the, the winner was determined, you know, always determined by the applause. So the more people that applaud, you know, it wasn't like writing your vote. So they, they went there like on a promo thing, you know, like to the different organizations and, hey, these are the, the Dick Contino's mom and dad, yeah, well, you got to come down there, you know, that type of thing. And how, what kind of influence that had, I don't know, but the, the night of a big contest. Johnny Mungle, who had won, you know, first was Pierce Knox, blind, uh, a black um, was a trombonist who played saber dance on the trombone. He, only, he won about three or four contests, but he came back to win his quarterfinal. And so uh, he was representing with the second quarter. Third, qu third quarter was was uh, an Irish tenor, Johnny Mungle, out of Flint, Michigan. He won oh, six or seven of them. And uh, so he was entitled to, you know, second uh, slot. And then there was Pierce Knox, 13, uh, 12 winnings to one tie, and he was in third spot, and I was in fourth. Well, we knew it. So anyway, be, be, between the me and Pierce, so Hyde comes on with a spin. So now I throw Hyde little curve. I think made a, made a little bit of a difference. Uh, in the I, I played lover, and in the uh, in the when I came back for the reprise, instead of just playing ba ba da da ba ba, instead of just as soon as I heard the band play ba 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 ba, you know, I went right to the bellow shake, right to the bellow shake. I mean, even though I didn't play the bellow shake in the song at that point. At the top of the song, I went right to just shake the shit out of that thing. Uh, you can't believe. Well, because I knew that when they applauded for Pierce, when they applauded for Pierce on his reprise, wow, it seemed like the, the applause could not get any louder. The cheers, the cheering, and the, uh, the velocity, uh, that's not going to get any louder. So at that moment, I was inspired to bellow shake, pow. Well, when he, when he cued the audience to cheer, to vote on mine, I heard my ears going, woof, 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 you know, like when uh, the sound gets, uh, like, really beyond, uh, you know, the, oh, the thing. But there was no question. I beat them. Well, you know, strange thing, though, that afternoon, it's really weird, that afternoon before the uh, contest, um... Nanny and Grandpa, they could sleep the night before. They could, you know, like any parent would be, I guess. Any parents would be. But I took a nap. I just felt tired and I didn't take a nap. I wasn't uh, nervous or weird thing. Anyway, when they gave me the belt and I did continue, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so now, uh, uh, we, we decided to carry this vendetta thing, see? Howard was in, he was leading this little troop, you know, like, well, he, he had your name taken down. And, oh, and in Newsweek magazine, right after that, so it would have to be maybe January or still December, because this was December 12 of 48, the finals. The first contest in Fresno was December 7 of 47. This was December 12 of 48. So sometime right after that, maybe the following week, Newsweek magazine comes out with a story. My picture, no Horace Hyde picture. And it says, Dick Contino thanked Horace Height, something to that extent, during the story, you know, about the young accordion player from Fresno winning all these contests. It was the hottest thing underlined in the country. Because Dick Contino thanked Horace Height when he won the finals. He said, but Horace, they said, but Horace Height should have thanked Dick Contino. Bang! That put the thing over the top. So now, you know, Height was going to say, ah, oh, this guy's getting too... So now, they, they, by this time, uh, you know what I mean, I think we were on NBC, and Height was going to CBS because he had an enormous offer to change networks, and they were going to, you know, they, they had this huge campaign going, and that's when uh, 
uh, my, my Howard inspired my folks to say, uh, let's just get, let's, uh, you know, I said, let's go back to Fresno. I won the finals. Let's go back. That was it. Let's go back to Fresno, you know. And, uh, and yet they, they were like, Horace Hyde is moving to the number one spot in the country. But all these, you know, radio broadcasts, commercials and stuff. So they, they knew that I was responsible that way for the popularity. But now I get on a train, you know, to go back to Fresno with my, my folks, Howard, you know. And uh, so I went to train with Howard and the folks were going back to California. And I tried to intercept this in Chicago, you know, uh, uh, you know pleading me, you know, with his representatives and the network pleading with me to get off the train and go back to New York. Oh, no, 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 my, the folks decide, no, we're going to follow this plan through, you know, in our ignorance or what, because by this time, I had a contract which was approved in court, a seven-year contract. And, uh, he's ready to take me to court with it and everything. So, but nevertheless, we still went back to California, and uh, so that's, you know, when we got out there, I mean, that's when, you know, I, I found out, <laughs> I found out that Howard was, was gay, you know, I mean, uh, we, we got back to California, I think we were over a friend's house or something like that, with, and, the, and so, we decided to share a double bed. You know, I think I tell you that story, Pete. You know, and uh, I, when I woke up and I could, I felt his hand on my ass. You know, just like, I thought, well, that's an accident. So I moved, and uh, you know, away. And then I thought maybe this is an accident. He just plopped his hand over. So all of a sudden, <laughs> his hand comes back on my ass. I was, whoa! I jumped out of that fucking bed. So, <laughs> and so anyway. The Atlantic, the Atlantic out there, you know. So anyway, <laughs> now we're going to get into the area where, you know, Height wants to take me to court. Because how we got that contract was, listen to this, you know, uh, right after I'd won, like, oh, three, four contests, whatever, five, five contests, he went in, he, he drew up this contract, and see, in those days, your folks, uh, 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 an adult, had to... Um, you know, in your family, they had to agree and sign the agreement that they, you know, that they're under the understanding that that uh, even though you're not of age, that you they approve. So naturally, though, when they got the contract, and Height said, uh, and they said, well, Mr. Height, uh, we'd like to have an attorney look at this. He says, wait a minute, don't you trust me? You know, the usual cliche. All I've done for your son, all I'm doing for him? Don't you trust me? But don't need, don't worry about it. Just sign it. So my folks, uh, you know, being humble that way, and especially my dad, yeah, how, he's not going to hurt Dickie. He said he wouldn't, you know. So they signed it. So that's why, you know, Height was uh, prepared to go to court because he had, uh, the, the contract was approved in court, but when the judge, because when the judge says, are you aware of the contents of this contract? And the three of us says, yeah, yes, Your Honor. Okay, so he approved it. And uh, Height was going to use that as his weapon in court. And uh, so I, wouldn't, I couldn't walk away from a seven-year contract, of which if something had happened to me, he was entitled to my life insurance. He had it down to a, what I later turned, we got into a big, like starting into a legal thing. It was making front page newspapers all over the country. You know, Contino accuses Height of slave labor contract, and Horace Height continues ungrateful, this and that. And the show was so hot that that was the last thing everybody expected to happen, I guess, for some reason. But then, you know, elements come into play. And uh, so we're going to that, get into that place. So a uh, guy, uh, at that time, uh, Petrillo, I forget his name, uh, first name, Caesar, Caesar Petrillo, he was... Uh, the president of the Musicians Union. Back in, in those days, the union was super strong. As a matter of fact, back in uh, 
the late 40s or uh, you know, late, let's see, the end of 47, certainly by 48. Petrillo, because he was unhappy with something regarding the musicians' uh, uh, scale and stuff, he ordered all the musicians to go on strike. It paralyzed the country. I mean, people, you know, recording artists, but then, back then everybody was recording, and uh, they strictly used musicians, you know, uh, no gimmick, straight, you know, musicians, and so they... So they, t they tried to record without musicians, you know, and people singing the oom pa pa with voices and stuff. That's how strong Pachillo was. So his right-hand man was a guy named Rex Riccardi, both Italian, you know. So uh, Rex Riccardi seemed, I guess he was, maybe, maybe they were both mob ties, because he called me up and he says, you get your ass here to New York. He says, I, we got to work this out. This, I don't like this in the paper. That's why we have a union. And back then, they were like czars, you know. So I thought, I don't think he understands, you know. Mr. Humble Me, you know. <laughs> I tell the folks, and I get the guests. Do we fly back? They told Height the same thing. So, because Height was all prepared to get me locked in for seven years. See? Six more years, like. So, uh, the folks. They said, we better go in there early and talk to Mr. Riccardi so he understands you're not just some, you know, punk from out west that's trying to take advantage. You know what I mean? Let's, let's let him determine what kind of person we, what we're, who we are and what we're trying to do. So we made an appointment to see him the day before. Uh, he made sure that we did, you know. He says, look, uh, if you have a problem, he says, uh, the union's supposed to handle it. You're not supposed to, you know go to court with this thing because I'm calling up Horace Ice. I want you I want you here in New York, whatever, you know, like next week or whatever it was, like in a couple of days or whatever. He says, I'm calling Height and he's going to do the same thing. And we'll, we'll settle it right here. So he was very, you know, firm with it. And like he was pissed off, almost like mob style, you know. I said, all right, so we referred to him as Mr. Riccardi. We'll be there, you know, so... My mom and dad thought, well, let's let's get there a uh, couple days early so we could, you know, meet him and let him know that we're not just, you know, some people trying to take advantage of anybody and so forth. So we got there, <clears throat> made the appointment to see him early, and so we sat down with him, you know. Proved to be, like I, I think I mentioned before, that he was uh, Napoleon, like... Uh, like Nanny, you know, like my mom. And so that established an immediate rapport. And all we had to prove is that we were nice people. So he pointed out, you know, that that uh, my mom and dad has agreed to the contract in court without really having it looked through. And he, he wanted this and that, and how he was uh, kind of treating me on the show with trying to take advantage and things like that, you know, and eliminate my name, like I mentioned before. Anyway, by the time he got through, he said, uh, look, he says, I want you to come back here. When you come back in tomorrow and, and Horace Hyde is here, I want you to repeat everything you said and see what he has to say in his defense. Well, he came back and Hyde was there. He was very, of course, he was very upset to even see me there, you know. And... Uh, so by the time we got through, you know, as we were getting into it, uh, Hyde saw that it was pretty overwhelming, and obviously we had a rapport with Riccardi. And uh, so at one point he just interrupted and said, look, he says, I'll, I'm going to take this to court, he says, and uh, I'm worth a lot of money, and uh, I'm standing on the contract. And I'll, I'll win the case. I'm not going to worry about it. So Riccardi immediately said, you know, like, uh, I'll tear up your, uh, your union card. Then where the hell will you be? Well, there you go. A little bit of trouble brewing. Um, I'll be back here again next Thursday. Again, thank you for tuning in. We'll keep this going. We get this controversial thing with the army beef that he got into. It's kind of... Man, I grew up with it, hearing about it, especially being his drummer, I would hear stories. So we'll get into that a little later. But again, I thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week.